Hey, Constantine. Oh, that, I'm, I'm quite jealous of your background. <laughs> Do you want me to change it to my natural background? No, 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 no. Well, I thought it was your natural background. <laughs> I win. <laughs> oh, yeah, I win. Oh, yeah. How's the weather? It's really cold. It's, uh, it's really cold here, actually. I can't uh, move around uh, on my shirt alone uh, at that time of the year. <laughs> Oh well, we'll we'll manage that. We'll manage Corona and we'll manage bad weather. Um, well, thanks for agreeing to do the interview. Obviously, yes, sir. Um, before I've been sitting here for fifteen minutes, I I am going to have a sip. But before we get into maybe the wine specifically, could you briefly do like a that's a short history of the of the winery itself, how it came about, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, the winery was founded by my father and my mother in uh, 1989. Uh, my father is actually from Cyprus, and he he went to study enology in the zone. Um, he was there for a few years and did his first harvest. And then he moved to Greece and worked as a consultant winemaker for a few years, for a few years. So at some point he started working with a big winery in the area, in uh, Mantegna, uh, where he came in contact with Moscofiller for the first time. He saw the potential of the variety uh, like no one else had because uh, the situation in Greece back then was a bit different, like the wine was not uh, so much part of the culture as it is today. And the area was mostly known for uh, big production and uh, lesser quality uh, wines. So he decided to start a winery. He started really small, just 10,000 bottles of Mantinia Moscofilero. And it started going well, so the winery uh, grew. Uh, at some point in 2004, he started the uh, venture in uh, Nemea, which is uh, the biggest viticulturist uh, viticulture area in Greece. It's mm. it's pretty close in Nemea. It's like 30 minutes. Uh, another PDO area, and uh, recently in 2014. My family as a whole spent a lot of time in Santorini every summer because a lot of winemakers, uh, friends and stuff. And it was always his dream to make a wine in Santorini. But uh, he wanted to do it on his terms. So when he found the opportunity to cooperate with a family that had her, their own uh, uh, vineyards, this was really important for us because Santorini is a special place and it's uh, really small parcels of land and it's diff you have to buy grapes, it's difficult. So after that, we expanded in Santorini. So nowadays we are uh, doing a production of about 500,000 bottles in all three wineries. Uh, the winery in Emea and in Santorini are smaller, but our our main winery, the, the the place where it all started, and our main focus has always been Mantinia and Moscofiller. Mm. Myself, uh, I studied chemical engineering, and then I did my master's in UC Davis in viticulture and enology. I did a few harvests in Napa, and then I was really lucky to, to do a harvest in... Uh, New Zealand, in Cloud mm. Bay, actually. And uh, since 2019, I'm back and I'm part of the of the winery as it is today. Interesting, interesting. Napa, New Zealand, and now back. Very interesting. <laughs> and are difference. you? It is a difference. Yes, it is certainly <laughs> a difference. But that's interesting about the world of wine, anyway. The differences. Obviously, and also, and also, sometimes the similarities, of course. Exactly, I would agree. Get that. 
Um, so uh, the binary started in what year was it? You're disappearing for a second. Are you still there? Sorry, I lost you. Yeah, we lost each I, other. I, I can hear uh, you now. How did uh, your father decide to um, to branch out and what grape varieties to include? So uh, my dad, uh, because he studied in France, he had this uh, uh, way of thinking, which is typical for like French winemakers. And he wanted to match firstly the terroir with a specific variety. Mm. At that point back then, uh, the indigenous varieties were not uh, on the first line. And uh, because here the vineyards in, uh, in Mantinia have really different soils. If, if you visit here, you will see that within a couple of miles, we have really clay, uh, from clay soils, red clay soils, to more gravelly with a lot of limestone mm. to So what he did in the beginning was much what he knew back then, like clay with Merlot, uh, limestone uh, with uh, Chardonnay, schist with uh, Gewurztraminer and uh, Riesling. Riesling wasn't a success here for some reasons. So we kind of started off with that uh, on the international varieties. But then uh, he, he changed his focus to the Greek varieties. Uh, Moschofilero is one variety that it's quite different to all these international varieties in respect to where it grows uh, really well. Uh, even uh, within Peloponnese, it's really hard to find the same expression of Moschofilero in other regions, probably because of the climate, of the continental climate here. Mm. So it's not like or Ayurgitico, that you will find it uh, really widespread in North Greece, in the islands. Moschofilero is mainly situated in uh, Mantinia. And uh, from there, he wanted to vinify each one of the so-called uh, noble Greek varieties in their place of origin. So that's, that's the main idea. Uh, find the expression in the native land of its uh, Greek variety. Uh, Ayurgitico in Emea. Our winery in uh, Nemea does only uh, three labels, all of them from Ayurgitico. And the same idea in Santorini with again three labels, all from Asirtico. Well, those are, of course, two grape varieties that are in recent years attracting a lot of international attention along with Xenomavro, of course, those are the, the three grape varieties for good reasons, because they're absolutely beautiful and uh, unique. Again, there are, of course, similarities. Uh, you could find, like, for example, Xenomavro is often labeled as the uh, Nebbiolo of Greece or exactly. something, which, which makes sense. There are still differences, but as it goes, people always need a point of reference, uh, okay. which brings me actually to the uh, Chardonnay and the Merlot that I have here. I do feel that both of these have a strong um, French influence to them, which in the case of Merlot is obviously Bordeaux, in the case of the Chardonnay, it's obviously Burgundy. That's clear. But but it's not a copy. Again, it's just a, a, a point of reference, which refers then to the elegance of the wine, with the food friendliness of the of the wine. And that certainly that they're not trying to create um, like nuance, it's, it seems to me, is very much key. 
and of course the French wines are very much about nuance. Um, that is of course partially a climate thing, although with climate change, things are becoming more and more tricky, obviously, but it's also a, a, a winemaker's philosophy, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, sorry for that. Um, the truth is that uh, you always ha need to have a, a strong point of influence, but also add uh, different, uh, different ideas in that. So uh, we started uh, with a point of reference in the way they, they choose uh, the varieties and the vinification in France. But then I think we, we evolved uh, in some aspects that are, that are closer to New World wines as well. So even our uh, studying background, like he was in France, I was in uh, US, we tried to combine uh, good uh, aspects of uh, both uh, philosophies. Um, for me, the importance is uh, the concentration of wine in combination with uh, some delicate character of the wines. I don't know if that makes sense for you, but it for me, it makes sense. Really... Power and ele and elegance yeah. at the same time. And uh, both wines uh, are made from single vineyard uh, uh, vineyards, and uh, their philosophy is that. They can, of course, be consumed uh, early when they are released, but uh, it's more important for us to see them uh, after at least a few years. Uh, for me personally, I, I've seen that uh, Merlot in the area has uh, is a really good uh, fit here. I don't know, because we have different varieties like Sardonnay has difficult years with the cultivation. Cabernet has years that it's great, but there are years that it's really hard for it to ripe. But Merlot, Merlot is always consistent and uh, it always has a, a similar expression that allow us to vinify in a way to, to give it concentration and uh, to believe that it can last uh, at least for a few decades in the in a bottle. Well, I can imagine that absolutely. Yes, I mean even between uh, yesterday evening and now, it has already uh, developed. It's something I like to do occasionally or as often as possible to see how a wine develops after opening for two, three, four days, which roughly gives you an indication of where it would head if you would keep it in the. In the in a cellar. Um, I agree. For me, I want to tell you that Merlot is uh, a special variety for me. I know that, of course, you don't have a favorite variety, but I really like varieties like Merlot because it has become kind of a black horse and uh, a variety that it's easily to blame for oh, yeah. uh, I I used to I used to hate <laughs> Merlot not you were not, not because of that not because of the movie Sideways or anything like yeah. that because that's of course in the US a very famous movie uh after which or as if the, I can uh, tell you a story my first week in UC Davis when we were talking about the planting of the varieties in California and uh, volumes and uh, areas. So the first uh, graph they saw us is planting of Merlot, which is uh, really at the top of the world, a constant line until the movie sideways, which starts to go all the way down. Yeah. And the second graph was Pinot Noir in California, which was almost near the bottom and it started like going up. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, it's amazing what a, uh... A little bit of pop culture can do. Exactly. Yes. But uh, 
so this this I, I can relate to this in respect to Moschofiller as well, because it has a similar story in Greece, yeah. not uh, at the same uh, extent, of course, but um, Moschofiller was a was an easy variety, easy because it has like uh, really. Uh, fl uh, strong floral aromas. It has high acidity and lesser body. So when you don't pay attention to it and you want to do big volumes, you can have lower quality wines. So mm. from really high sales, at some point, it started to have a, a bad name in the market and it really fell. And other varieties took its place, but this gave the chance in the producers for the producers in the area to rethink the whole way of uh, approaching winemaking of Moscow Filero. And uh, now it's not uh, on the first line, it's, it's not uh, so uh, fancy and in fashion like varieties like Malaguzia here or Xinomavro, but because there are a lot, uh, there are efforts with uh, more thinking into them and more effort. I think in a few years there will be a new cycle of Moscow filler, at least that's my opinion on that. It would be interesting. I mean, Greece has hundreds of indigenous uh, grape varieties, of course. So there's a lot, a lot to choose from. Um, and since Greece still, uh, Greek wines are still on the rise and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they will continue to do that in the next couple of decades. Okay. In part, of course, in part, thanks to excellent production of of internationally known and renowned grape varieties, of course, uh, like uh, Merlot, uh, like uh, Chardonnay. Uh, Greece produces, if you ask me, some of the finest Syrahs on the face of the planet, but that's me. You can disagree if you want, but... Um, uh, I agree, but I'm not objective, so... <laughs> Yeah. What is objective? Uh, <laughs> of course, that's, that's another thing. That's, that's the whole idea of wine. Objective but, there is, is but apart from that, there is, of course, uh, a, a, a huge array of, of, of native uh, varieties to choose from um, um, that can still, of course, also nationally or or regionally or whatever you want to call it and then also internationally can can find a big big audience if if those grape varieties are of course given the, their proper uh respect and attention so it will be it would be very interesting to see what's what's happening in the next decades i i, I think um I really think that Greece can produce uh, really high-end high wines of international varieties and maybe most times in a better price range than other countries. For now, of but, course, that is the... Uh, for now. Yeah. But I think it will take a few, a few decades until uh, a producer like me can... Uh, export significant uh, volumes of Merlot in a, in a big market. Mm. Uh, I think uh, uh, wine consumers globally get more familiar with Greek wines, but uh, we should uh, keep intensifying the efforts because sometimes uh, we we go over our head and we think that uh, Greece is, uh, there is a long way to go until uh, uh, Greece is respected uh, at the significance level for their international wines, uh, you, in my you opinion. Do you see a certain, a certain uh, pattern or trend there? Because obviously no one 
will take no one will ever take the the entire wine world by storm uh, just like that are there specific countries that are warming up to greek wines more than others at the moment yeah uh, for me clearly us is a market that uh, opens up easier and because i lived there i can, I can understand that uh, um, uh, U.S. citizens as a, as a whole, they are more open-minded for uh, to try anything new, like not only a Greek wine, but even uh, uh, something that uh, is uh, between wine and something else. Like they, they are really open to to new flavors, but also at the same time they have a, a, a specific palate. Like they are uh, more uh, eager to try uh, a bit sweeter, more round, uh, mm. uh, less acid than uh, European countries like Germany, for example. So I see which is of course that... because because wines from let's say Napa Valley, which are the most highest prized and praised wines in the U.S. Sorry, Washington. It, it, um, it's of course because these are very warm climates, which will get warmer in years to come. Obviously, in a country like Germany, where or France, where people predominantly drink uh, wines produced in their own countries, which I can't blame them, obviously. But since these are slightly cooler all in all cooler climate wines it means higher assets maybe less fuller bodies maybe less um as you said less intensity to yeah. a degree uh, for example for me it would be easier to to familiarize an american entry consumer in greek wine to an Ayurgitico than to Exinoma, bro. It's it's oh, really closer to, to, to what they like. So true. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Yes. And then of course, there's a I think there's a downside to having this idea of uh, the Xinomavro, which is one of my favorite grape varieties. I have to say. Me as well. Earth. Um, there is a downside, perhaps, to to having that label of being called uh, the Nebbiolo of Greece. Although, it, it on the one hand, it is of course a selling point, but on the other hand, people here just I again, totally agree. Nebbiolo, yeah. and they so obviously. Like, for example, if an Italian hears, you have to try Xino Mavro, it is the Nebbiolo of Greece. No Italian, you're going to say impossible, away with exactly. it or something like that. So It's like when a new footballer rises and they are always like the new Messi, the new Ronaldo. And when you hear that, of course, you get uh, interested. But at the same but point, there's an expectation you know, that cannot be met. Yeah. And for me, that's uh, that's the huge advantage of uh, Assyrtico because um, Assyrtico doesn't have the need to be compared to another variety. Like people start to know Assyrtico just as Assyrtico. That is true, yeah. And, and that variety has a huge, huge advantage uh, that I've seen. Uh, that uh, it can really withstand heat and not lose quality. I've seen it in Santorini in really difficult years. Like there are other indigenous varieties and uh, there are burns, there is the quality drops, there is not uniformity and stuff, but the Sirtico uh, can resist to all that. And that's why I think that in the future, it has a huge advantage even globally to get a lot of plantings and be even more widespread. 
because I wanted to, to tell you that I think uh, one of the main problems of Greece as a whole, um, wine wise, is that. Uh, um, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're back. Yes. Sorry, sorry for that. That uh, uh, Greece cannot make huge volumes, volumes of wine. Uh, which of course, uh, it's not uh, what we want, but at the same point, you cannot start a, a global awareness campaign uh, in the aspect of uh, Malbec, because you will never have the volumes to, to make uh, some variety known to people that don't usually drink wine. And at the same time, because uh, the production is uh, focused on smaller scale wineries, even if you try to make a bigger volume uh, wines, it won't be at the same quality level as in other countries that are, have worked in that aspect for many decades and know how in, to do it. In that respect, I would say it is a from a financial standpoint, it is, of course, a maybe curse is a strong word, but certainly a, a, there's a downside to it. But of course, when it comes to authenticity and quality, that is, that's an absolute plus. Uh, and there too, it's, I, I guess it's like so many things in life, it's about finding that proper balance between those two. That is very, very hard. And you have to keep, you have to keep finding it. It's not a holy grail that once you found it, there's a recipe to the balance. It's it continues to change on a yearly basis uh, due to many, many, many factors, of course. So in that sense, it's hard to predict the future of anything, obviously. Uh, even in our winery, this is true. Like uh, at some point we try to to find a balance between uh, production and uh, quality. And uh, we had to make a really difficult uh, decision. Like when the, the brand started to, to grow, it was like, um, do we make even more, uh, even higher production? So we get higher awareness, but then we have to go to an entry wine that would be at a lower price. But both me and my dad uh, did, didn't want to go there. It wasn't part of our philosophy. And uh, we decided that we will limit the production to a specific number, which might be big for, uh, for Greece. But as a whole, it's, uh, it's a small scale winery. Like in New Zealand, we would be super tiny. Uh, and this is hard in a market like uh, in the in the COVID area because you don't work so much uh, with uh, supermarkets and retail. But every winery has a different philosophy, has a different target. So you just have to find your own. There is not a good wine, bad wine. Everything is needed. Like even. Uh, even really low price wines for me are really important because they are the ones that convert consumers from other alcoholic drinks to wine. So yes. we would never be like, uh, uh, have our head held high and be like, no, I only drink uh, uh, wines of a certain quality. Everything is needed, but every winery is different. And in my opinion, you have to just find your philosophy and stick with it and not try to do everything at once because that's what will not work in my opinion. That uh, sounds very wise, yes. How close are you and your father in terms of overall overarching wine philosophy considering that you both have, if, if one can say it like that, have a, a, a very different backgrounds in terms of benchmark old world style which france and then 
if there is such a thing, arguably, maybe not benchmark New World style, but certainly most the most New World style of the New World styles, which is in a place. As you That's said before, it, it's all a matter of uh, balance. Again. Um, <laughs> <we're>... <laughs> We are really lucky because we have a, a team of, we are four winemakers uh, that work here. So we are like separated two and two, uh, two more new world, uh, less oak, uh, more delicate. And my dad and the other guy are like strong wines, concentration, more complexion with oak. And uh, there is always this uh, debate, but I think at the end, we agree somewhere in the middle, which for me, it's, it's a way to go. Not everyone would agree to that, but I think the truth is always somewhere in the middle most times. Well, I seem to agree and I can really, I can feel that approach um, in the wines. Um, what I was there is a change. About, sorry? So the, there is a change of the philosophy through the years. Like uh, it's really subtle and uh, really, really small. But uh, through the years, the use of folk has been a bit uh, has become a bit more limited. The last decade uh, that when it that uh, when uh, we started. But while I'm totally pro this change. Uh, sometimes I even doubt about this choice because I try wines from the beginning of, uh, from the close to the foundation of the, of the winery and they are still in, on their prime and super more expressive than the first few years. And then I really wonder like maybe in the first stages of their lives, delicacy is better, but what about the long term? So it's still a debate in my mind whether... Of course. But then again, the long-term is always a risk uh, as well. Yeah. But also, obviously, long-term or longevity in wine, it will take a long time for it to make itself apparent. Exactly. And uh, if you get a wine in the market, uh, you have to make sure that it's... Uh, uh, ready to drink at, at that point. So again, I think again, it's a matter of balance, like finding, finding the silver lining between the two. Absolutely. What I was going to ask, uh, of course, there's a lot of Syrah planted in Greece. There is uh, quite a bit of Merlot and let's say the Bordeaux varieties or not all of yeah. them, but let's say Merlot and um, 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 Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sauvignon Blanc, quite a bit as well. Um, um, how does a grape variety like Gewürztraminer and end up in Greece? Unless I missed something and it, the place is, it's growing everywhere, but I don't think so. How, how did that happen? Uh, as I told you, uh, he, uh, when my dad started trying to match the, the variety with uh, the, the soil, first and foremost. So when we did an analysis and we saw this heat that was really intense, of course, he, th he thought about Alsace and the varieties grown there. Uh, another really important uh, variable was the climate. Like people may think uh, they see like uh, Greece and consider that everything is the same and uh, there is the same uh, really hot Mediterranean climate. Mm -hmm. But actually, Dinia is a uh, is a region three. I think uh, it's it's. It's not a hot climate. It's uh, at least moderate. It's really continental. Uh, even the city, the, the altitude is uh, 720. So all of our 
uh, vineyards that are above uh, 740 meters. So it's not a, a real surprise. Like we, we experimented with varieties uh, that were more uh, cold climate, like, as I told you, Riesling, it wasn't a success. Pinot Noir, he studied in Burgundy. So I asked him, why didn't you make a Pinot Noir when you came here? Like, yeah. uh, it seems like a good fit. And he told me that uh, they had a planting of uh, Pinot Noir. And actually in the vineyard that the Givus Traminer is now. And like a couple of weeks before harvest, the bees would come and would destroy the whole production. So mm. there was nothing to do about it. So with experimentation and also uh, the philosophy from France, that's how we ended up with uh, Traminer. Uh, and of course, the final judge is the, the wine produced. Like we did it. Uh, it was a really huge success in Greece commercially because uh, it's, uh, it's, an, a wine, it's a variety that it's easy for the consumers to, to get into it. And uh, for me, the, uh, the area gave a special acidity which Gewurztraminer lacks in general. So again, we found the balance in that wine as well. So it is a grape variety that, that Greek people are open to, uh, to uh, get to know and to enjoy? Yes. Um... Of course, all of our wines are dry style, but as I told you, people that are not wine consumers, uh, they, they like this uh, aromatic profile and uh, they, they were really open to it in the, in the Greek market. Of course, there are very few labels uh, from Gewurztraminer in Greece, mm. but uh, it's working. Interesting. As of it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And how how would you look at the the the, the average Greek uh, consumer in general? What is actually um, because we talked about the Greek as an uh, exporter to claim a place on the international market, but how is it? What's the, what are the habits in Greece themselves among wine consumers? How, how is that developing? First of all, I think that there has been a huge, huge shift in the um, knowledge and the, in the openness of uh, wine consumer in Greece the last uh, 15 years, mm -hmm. not more than 15 years. And I could see that from my own friends that uh, at the beginning would come to, to wine expos just because I was there and was a producer and they would just make fun of uh, wine and stuff. And then I went to, US, to USA and I came back and I found the same people that would never even order a bottle of uh, wine when they go out to know all about producers, varieties, new labels. There was a huge uh, boom uh, with the Greek gastronomy and uh, a lot of wine bars in Athens, which that's, are really- I know a couple of them, yes, that's true. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You have visited them like, a few times. <laughs> it's, it's interesting because what I, I feel like that shift has happened, has really happened from the inside out as well. Like it's not something that it's, I might be wrong, but it is specifically Greek wine that is being consumed in Greece, right? Which is, which is very interesting because as you said, if you look at it, there isn't that much, there's very little mass production happening in Greece. Uh, and that combination is very interesting. Could you somehow, what are your thoughts on, on that? How did that happen? Uh, 
I think that it's it's going this uh, that way, and it's uh, because uh, it, it's for different reasons. I think one of the reasons is that uh, with the Greek crisis, a lot of people went abroad, so they came in contact with uh, wine tasting and wine uh, in a different uh, background, um, in a different matrix. So when they came back from France, from uh, Italy, uh, they they had the culture to seek the the Greek efforts. Also, the crisis really helped in the matter that Greek consumers support Greek products. So, and because uh, many of them are farmers, and uh, there is a a very big tradition of uh, grape growing, not in a professional level, but every grandfather has a small barrel and it used to be bulk wine. But this, this personal experience of each one has transformed into an eagerness to learn about uh, the, um, the new age of Greek wines. So, uh, it's, so in a strange way, it has happened from the outside, just not in the sense that yeah. the outside wine world imposed some sort of palate on the Greek population, but that Greek people who went abroad came back and brought with them a, a, a new thirst for not just wine, but specifically Greek wine. And Greek grape varieties. Exactly, uh, tourists as well. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge aspect of the matter. Like at some point, Greece wa was not really known about the good quality of services. It was more about authenticity and like uh, personal affection of people. But then at some point the tourists started to grow and people had to realize that uh, we need to become more professional and uh, the the contact uh, with the tourists that would ask for uh, greek wines and greek varieties gave them an incentive to ask more greek wines from uh, their buyers and it created uh, a cycle that uh, really helped Greek uh, Greek labels to grow mm. in the in our market. I'm happy it did. <laughs> I'm happy to so how do you see as how do you see the um, your near future i mean the Tselepos winery specifically how do you see yourself uh, developing in the next coming years let's let's not go to, into decades for now but just in the next okay time. so there is a a huge uh, decision that has been made a couple of years ago um our vineyard here is about uh, 55 hectares and it's a really difficult place to cultivate because it's uh, not flat at all. It's all different aspects and really high angles. But uh, we made the decisions uh, when I came back to, to try and uh, convert organic. So we, this this decision has been made. We are uh, in the I'll process. I'll drink to of that. Conversion. Yeah, and which, uh, you sounded a bit apprehensive when you said it, which I understand. It is it is a of course a huge. Um, it's also a huge mental investment. I'm sure. It's, it's, yeah, uh, I'm sure you will have a lot of a, sleepless it's... organic sleepless nights. It's a really big risk, especially in an area like uh, Mantinia, that it's it's a plateau essentially. There is there are mountains all around. You don't have the uh, the effect of a big uh, volume of water nearby, 
so there is a bit more danger for uh, um, uh, for diseases for disease pressure so we wouldn't go there if we didn't i i truly believe that organic wines in the long run will make better quality wines at the same time uh, greece suffers from cli for climate uh, change especially us i've seen it both in uh, nemea and santorini which if things keep getting worse we'll have huge problems with production and also here in Mantinia, which is a cold climate, it won't be affected at the same degree. But at the same time, we see a lot of extreme uh, weather incidents. Like uh, last year, uh, in 2017, we had a huge problem with oil. And this starts to get uh, more frequent. Like last year, we had a hail uh, uh, fall six hours before we harvest the Givuts Raminer. Luckily, it was only heard like uh, one, one part of the vineyard. We lost 10, 15% of the production. But it's, uh, it's something- it's a trend we, we that continues, it yes. can be yeah. catastrophic, of course, yeah. So sustainability, okay, of course, People always talk about sustainability. Sometimes it's vague, it's generic, but I truly believe that uh, you can do whatever you want to minimize the problem uh, in your own house. And uh, if everyone does the same, maybe there will be a significant change at some point. So for us, it's important to invest in that. And we are taking a lot of steps towards that uh, uh, aspect. I think to answer your questions that um, we always try to improve the quality of, of our wines. The truth is we give great care to our vineyards. I think already we do the best we can. So we try to invest in equipment and uh, people with knowledge to improve even better the quality. But another thing that we try to develop is uh, wine tourism mm -hmm. in all three regions. So we are we changed we we made a new tasting room here in Mantinia, even though we don't have the flow of people to support it uh, at least for now. And we are planning to to do the same in uh, Nemea and Santorini. And uh, for me, this is really important from my personal experience because I've seen that well, whichever wineries I've ever visited, that whenever I go to a restaurant and I see the wine list, I will always like make a, at least have a thought about the winery I visited and I will have an incentive to order their wine. So it's not about uh, financial numbers. And of course, if this happens, it's a, it's a great it's thing. It's a beautiful side product. Side product, exactly. But the most important thing is creating a bond between your consumer and uh, some kind of loyalty. Uh, Absolutely. And also a consumer's, a consumer's awareness of problems at that, hand as well. Uh, exactly. And the consumer can, I think, as a consumer, we can also, I mean, we're all in the same boat, basically, when it comes to climate change. Of course, as a producer, the, the, the problems are much more uh, in your face on an everyday basis. But as a consumer, you know, numbers of bottles will go down, etc. Wines will not have the characteristics that you might, you know, have used to. In Bordeaux, for example, I, I read, I mean, Bordeaux specifically last year had a huge I mean, it was catastrophic, I, I, France in general, but specifically Bordeaux. And, um, and they're now thinking of uh, 
introducing new or different grape varieties in order to sort of even high in, in order for the wine to remain authentically Bordeaux, which is when you think about it, that's a crazy, crazy thing. That especially that from from France, uh, especially from and especially from the Bordeaux region, and that's that. I think that really shows us the how severe the situation is, and I and I I do think that as a consumer, that is something that we we together with those people who are kind enough and hardworking enough to to give us what we want which is a great glass of wine is to to also be aware and to be very conscious and to to in 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 our cho choice of buying wines and in our I, what I would call the ethics of drinking, of consum of wine consumption, to um, to assist honest working, forward looking uh, wineries as much as possible. Um, because we're all in it together, and we have to find a way to maneuver through this changing landscape together. I think uh, I totally agree with you. I think that I can talk about Greece mostly. I think there is a growing awareness. Um, as one of the reasons is, as I told you before, a lot of people of my generation want to live abroad and uh, got uh, a different uh, culture in in that kind of things like uh, recycling or uh, sustainability stuff that would take a, a few decades to become that aware in greece uh, by itself and uh, that really helped however there is still a long way to go. I think uh, Greece is still um, a bit slow in their rates, uh, but there are other variables going into this, like um, Greece has a lot of islands. Sometimes things get harder, like even if you, you try to follow a plan, uh, the actual uh, footprint, would, would get bigger because of the movement of products from the islands to the mainland. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that Greece will be one of the first countries that will be aff affected. Uh, there could be even whole areas that in, uh, in, in many years, I hope, will not be that suitable for grape growing. And we can, the only thing we can do is uh, self-responsibility, do our part and hope for the best. I don't think you can do anything more than that at this point. That's true. Produce responsibly, responsibly and drink responsibly. Okay. Exactly and work together on that. Right. On that note, Aris, I'd say thank you for, I mean, we can, I, I think we can talk for hours, but I think this I, is a, I, there, there, it's, it's, there, great. it's a good final coda. Well, not final, but a good coda to the conversation now. And um, let's, uh, I would say let's continue that conversation next year with a new vintage. If possible, face to face, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I drop by. Uh, I would love that. Uh, it was a great talk for me as well. Uh, as you said, I could go on for hours because I see we have a lot of common points. And uh, let's do it uh, in person uh, next year. Either one so. when this uh, 
this other this 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 other problem has disappeared. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aris. Uh, thank you again. It's been my thank pleasure. You so much. And uh, well, Stin Yamas. Sure. Good luck to you, yeah. your family, the vineyard, etc. And in one way or another, we'll uh, talk again soon, sooner or later. Stay safe and uh, enjoy life and wine the best possible. But thank you very much. Thank you. Salam. Yes. Sir. <laughs>